Good evening. I'm Dr. Brian Henning, Professor of Philosophy and Environmental Studies at Gonzaga University, and it's my pleasure to join you and welcome you this evening uh, to the last event in our lecture series for this fall 2022 school year. I am the director of the Gonzaga Center for Climate, Society, and the Environment at Gonzaga University in Spokane, Washington, and I'm honored to host this event tonight uh, with colleagues from the Department of Environmental Studies and Sciences. To start, I'd like to recognize that we are on the ancestral lands of the Spokane tribal people, the people of the river. In fact, Gonzaga University only exists because we were invited to these lands uh, by the indigenous people of this space. And uh, we recognize that this area is uh, it's sacred to them and that we are the latest caretakers of this space and have much uh, to do in order to be able to deserve to continue to inhabit this space uh, for many generations to come. The Gonzaga Center for Climate Society and the Environment was uh, founded in order to provide um, assistance to our area to better understand and respond to the urgency of the climate crisis. Uh, we're here to provide innovative interdisciplinary scholarship, teaching, consulting, and capacity building, and hosting events like this one this evening is an example of that work. Uh, in the Zoom event, you'll notice that we're on a Zoom webinar. Uh, the chat feature is disabled except to communicate with uh, the panelists. Uh, instead, you can use the Q&A feature to pose questions at any time during the talk, whether during the speaker's comments or during the Q&A time. Um, I've also enabled it so that you can vote questions up and down. So feel free to use that feature to respectfully pose questions that we might be able to have time to engage with. Um, I'm also actually just realized that I should probably turn on the, um, uh, I will try and figure out a way to turn on the closed captioning as well, if I can remember how to do it. And um, also this event is, as you notice, being recorded. And so uh, it will be posted to our YouTube channel uh, within a short time. Uh, so if you want to share it with someone else, then you can do that. And now it's my great pleasure to welcome and introduce our speaker this evening. Our guest is Dr. John Abasaglu, Associate Professor in Management of Complex Systems at the University of California, Merced. Dr. Abasaglu received his bachelor's degree in atmospheric science from UC Davis and his doctorate in earth system science from UC Irvine. Dr. Abasaglu's academic interests are primarily focused around climate science and impacts in the American West. His climatology lab works on a diverse set of research questions spanning climate science and meteorology, as well as their impacts on systems, including water resources, wildfire, and agriculture. The research group also develops web-based climate services to help scientists and practitioners improve climate readiness. Actually, it's because of some of those tools that he and his team developed that I first uh, learned about Dr. Abasaglu's work. Uh, it's the, through the web-based tool at Climate Toolbox that I, that I actually learned about a lot of his work through a NOAA-funded community-driven effort called the Spokane Climate Project. The city of Spokane learned how to use that powerful uh, suite of data visualization tools. Again, that's at uh, www.climatetoolbox.org, uh, where you can interact with all sorts of interesting climate models and learn uh, about projected climate impacts. And using those tools, our community... Uh, community members, uh, regular uh, citizens and community members learned how to use these tools to answer questions related to temperature, precipitation, snow pack, stream flow, wildfire smoke. And we generate our own re report with the assistance of his team. Um, at You can find it at spokaneclimateproject.org. Uh, yet some of people would question the wisdom of relying on climate models, arguing that nothing can replace scientific boots on the ground and that actually that could be a um, an, uh, sort of a dangerous uh, redirection of resources that should go to primary science. But as we observe in the proceedings of COP27 going on right now in Egypt, it's common to find frequent references to climate models, whether to explore different climate futures or to justify different policy proposals. So given the increasing centrality of this discussion of climate models, our talk tonight is both timely and important. Please join me in welcoming Dr. John Abatsaglu to discuss the credibility of climate models. Great, thanks Brian for the introduction. Um, also thank you to the Gonzaga Center for Climate Society and the, and the Environment for the invitation to speak. And then everybody, of course, thank you for joining us. Um, as I pull up my slides here, I'll also, um, let me go share my screen. 
and share everything. Um, so yeah, as Brian mentioned, um, I had the pleasure of um, living and working in the Inland Northwest. I was a faculty at the University of Idaho for 12 years, and there I became intimately familiar with the climate as well as the climate impacts to the very beautiful part of the region. Um, we worked a lot, of course, with folks in the Northwest, sort of trying to understand um, the influence of climate today, as well as sort of climate change in terms of how that would manifest itself in terms of impacts. And of course, identify ways to adapt and potentially also mitigate some of the impacts that would be forthcoming. So the, the topic here that we're talking about today is climate models. Uh, and I will be the first or not the first to tell you that this is a, a lot to sort of pack into uh, about a 45 minute talk or so. Um, so we're going to sort of touch on a few basic things here. I'm going to give you a high level overview of what climate models are for, a little bit, of, a little bit about the philosophy of why we have to use models. We'll talk about how these models um, can be used in hypothesis testing as part of learning about science. And then we'll also look at what these models foretell in terms of some of the projected changes for the region. Um, given that this is somewhat of a you know complicated topic, what I wanna do is also present sort of the story about the credibility of climate models along with story of climate change. And we know that the story of climate change is already partially written. Right? We've seen a lot of climate change already manifest itself across the region, but we also know that part of that story is not written yet. And that is why we have to, we can look at climate models to tell us the future, but also they can tell us how potentially we can modify what that future may look like. Okay. So uh, um, as Brian mentioned, I am a climatologist and that means that I think a lot about climate. And um, when I think about climate, at least living in the Northwest, in the inland Northwest, um, I, I know there's a lot of reasons in which, in, in, there's a lot of ways in which climate influences a region. And I, one of my, uh, one of the things I think is relevant is that climate ends up defining a lot of the resources and ultimately the culture of a region, right? So water ends up, the abundance and timing of water are really important in de determining the agricultural productivity of an area, the recreational opportunities, right? These things really set the tone for defining a region's culture. And therefore, as climate changes, some of those resources may change as well. We don't tend to notice climate, of course, when climate behaves as it's supposed to behave, <laughs> quote unquote normal. We tend to notice climate when it misbehaves, when we get those extremes, right? And those extremes can be too much water, right? Heavy precipitation events, the lack of water, right? Wildfires, the impacts of smoke, the impacts that that has on agricultural uh, labor. And of course, heat. And the Northwest is no stranger to heat. Uh, this picture here about, uh, of, of the, the grizzly bear, the sort of grizzly bears from Washington state, coping with what was then an historic heat wave in 2015. And apparently in 2021, you had a, a little bit of a worse heat wave. So we have found ways to cope with some of these extremes. And in some cases, we have found ways in which they're impacting us in, in pretty devastating ways. Um, the story, of course, of climate change is that we've seen about a degree, a degree 1.2 degrees Celsius worth of warming. You've sort of seen figures like this before. Um, something like 23 of the last 24 warmest years uh, have happened since the year 2000, right? So the data basically show us that warming is occurring. And when we look at the amount of warming that has occurred, right, globally, it's, it works out to about two degrees Fahrenheit, which, you know, to some degree is a small number, right? It, you know, for example, by the, if we look at the temperature outside uh, at the start of this talk and the temperature outside by the end of the talk, it might drop by more than two degrees Fahrenheit. And likewise, day-to-day -day variability in, in temperatures often varies by more than two degrees Fahrenheit. But of course, two degrees Fahrenheit has had its impacts, right? Two degrees Fahrenheit worth of warming has had its impacts globally and locally. And so at least the story that we've seen play out across the Western United States, and this is one of many stories, but some of the hallmark indicators of a changing environment and climate change is the decline in mountain snowpack, particularly the decline in spring snowpack. And these are some long-term records from snow courses across the West. And those concentric circles there that are orange and red are indicating substantial declines over the past 70 years in April 1st snow water equivalent. 
And of course, uh, part of that is warming, right? Um, as there's less snow remaining by spring, that means there is less flow in the rivers, that is, right? And so we've seen a pretty strong declines in uh, summer and late spring runoff, especially in our snowmelt dependent watersheds, which include a lot of the important water resources for the Northwest. Okay. And I'm rhyming here if you follow along. So less snow, less flow, more fires grow, right? We've certainly seen a lot of changes um, in our forested systems. But one thing that we've seen also change is we've shifted to a substantially warmer and drier climate in the summertime. Fire seasons are much longer, much hotter, much drier. And we see that on a year to year basis, there's a really strong relationship between how warm and dry conditions are during the fire season and how much burned area happens in forested environments across the broader West. So, Again, that's sort of one line of sort of how climate change, and again, this you know, two degree Fahrenheit worth of warming globally, the first half of our climate change story, how that's played out. And we, we, we've learned some things, right? We've learned that we are sensitive to climate variability and climate change. We also know that we're no longer waiting for climate change. We're in it now, right? And the best available science, which is what we're gonna be talking about here, at least in the context of modeling, suggests that there's a lot more change ahead of us, and hence we should expect more impacts. So, um, you know, science is, is, is a process where um, scientists are all, always trying to learn more about the world or process, right? And I like to think about this as sort of like a puzzle that we're continually trying to fill in. And the art of science is basically taking a puzzle piece and locking it in. What also is true about science is that we can take a puzzle piece and revise it, right? So science is open to revision. Um, that being said, the field of climate science and climate change probably looks something like this puzzle right now. There's a lot that we know. There's also elements that we don't know, right? And as time goes on, we'll fill in some of these pieces, but there's really no science where all the puzzle pieces are filled in. And so climate models is sort of are, are sort of are sort of a little bit like this. So we'll talk about you know what we know and what we don't know from climate models, but a lot of the core that goes into climate models comes from the fundamental science that we've been conducting in atmospheric science, right? But also in some of the other processes, because climate models ultimately capture interactions between the atmosphere and the ocean and the biosphere and the lithosphere, right? All these different earth system processes are involved. So it's really integrating all the knowledge that we have um, from you know, earth science as it relates to climate. Okay, but like, like this puzzle piece, right? Like, like this picture we're looking at here, at some point we have to determine some sort of a change, right? We, we're, we, we probably know this is a bowl of fruit, right? We may not know how many grapes are up in that upper left-hand corner. And that's ultimately what we're gonna be looking at when it comes to climate models. There's some fuzziness, but the picture is, you know, we know what we're looking at here. The other reason that we have to really look at climate models as something to focus on in terms of sort of climate projections, as well as understanding theories and hypotheses regarding climate and climate change is that, you know, the field of climate science, we're looking at earth, right? And um, in some fields, for example, in biology, for example, there's a hypothetical virus that's uh, <laughs> rolling across the planet. We want to test out whether uh, a vaccine is effective at sort of, you know, mitigating some of the impacts of that virus, we can perform experiments, right? And we would perform those experiments with people, with rats, you know, half of them get a placebo, half of them get a sort of a, a serum, and you can test things out. We, we just can't do that with the planet, right? And in some cases, we may be already performing an experiment on the planet. We have a sample size of one, um, and we don't want to make a mistake. So that is really one reason why we have to rely on models when it comes to understanding a lot of earth science phenomena, especially when it comes to the climate system. Take a couple of steps back here and talk about sort of scientific models in general, right? So climate models are a type of scientific models. There's a lot of different types of scientific models. Some are mathematical, some are conceptual. They're all trying to represent real world phenomena, 
processes, right? They are also building blocks to science, okay? Um, they, they try to do a few things, right? And so a model could be used to try to explain or predict behavior of a system, right? And so when it comes to climate change, we're, we're, we're to some degree trying to predict what's going to be happening in the forthcoming decades. But also models like this and climate models including are really important in testing out hypotheses, right? Um, again, with the observational record, there's so much we can actually test out, right? We can't run sort of uh, typical experiments with a planet, right? So we have to rely on models to some degree here. And then models in general can help guide decision making, right? There's some famous quotes, and I'm going to butcher it, but effectively, you know, all models are wrong, but some provide useful information. The idea is, is that these models can help us guide decision making. They may not tell us the answer. We may not be after an answer in general. We just want guidance here in many cases. Um, so I, I'm gonna throw this up here and, and have people think about what models they use. Um, and I, I'm not gonna look at the chat, but I'm gonna give you a second and I'll, uh, I'll just interject eventually um, because I have something that I think you all use. Um, whether you know it or not, you probably don't use it directly. But um, I'm probably also, there's also other things that folks are using that I'm not going to get to. So the one model that you probably do all use, you, in, you use information from it, are weather forecasts, right? Whether it's, on your, whether it's on your phone, you know, you have an app on your phone, whether it's a TV meteorologist, right? You're getting information about weather that's being forecasted for tomorrow, the next day, the next day. Um, that information is pretty important. You probably use that information to determine what activities to do, you know, how to dress. Um, that information gets used for some pretty important decisions that involve large dollars and life or death situations as well. Now, we all know when weather forecasts go wrong, right? We all remember when weather forecasts go wrong as well. It turns out that weather forecasts are a type of model, right? And those models are actually fairly accurate. Um, and the reason why this is an example that I'm talking about is because it ends up that a numerical weather forecast model has a lot of the same core that a climate model has. So it, it provides an entry point to talking about climate models. So a lot going on in this figure. We're not going to talk about all these diagrams, all these vectors going up and down, but effectively this is sort of showing us the processes that might go on within a numerical weather model. And a numerical weather model basically takes initial conditions, the temperature outside right now, right, pressure, things like that, things like that we can measure. And then it, it, it super, it, it basically um, puts that up against a set of thermodynamic and dynamic equations that describe the time evolution of the atmosphere, right? And it's gonna count for all these things on this diagram here. Um, I will show you one, one single, equation, and this equation looks scary, but it's not. Effectively, a numerical weather model is trying to do this. It's taking your initial conditions, for example, the temperature outside right now, right? We want to know what the temperature outside is going to be in an hour. Best piece of information that you can possibly get is what the temperature is right now, right? And then we're going to assume that factors are going to influence that temperature over the next hour. And that's what's written on the right-hand side of the diagram here. So as the sun sets, typically, right, we have radiative cooling at the surface and your temperature is generally cool. There might be a cold front that moves in or a warm front that moves in that'll also modify temperature. But for a weather forecast model, really important thing is initial conditions. But the stuff here on the right-hand side, that's that process through thermodynamics and dynamics that's, that's following laws of physics, right? Um, that we've, we've known for quite some time and it's running it through a, a computer model, right? That's solving a lot, of, a lot of equations through time. Okay. So moving over to talking about climate models. So again, climate models share some of the same guts, if you will, that numerical weather models have. The difference is many, right? One, numerical weather models typically run out for the next you know, five to 16 days, 
right? And beyond that, forecast tends to degrade, you know, usually around 10 days or so. Reasons for that is that we don't really know for true, for, we don't really know the initial conditions that well. So there's some error in that. Climate models are trying to do other things though. So they're trying to incorporate how all these other processes, right? The biosphere, right? Vegetation and soils, how those things are interacting with climate through carbon fluxes, how the ocean interacts with the atmosphere and the atmosphere interacts with the ocean and then the lithosphere as well. So all these different processes are trying to be captured by climate models. Climate models are also run for more than 16 days, right? We have climate models that are run for um, multiple hundreds of years, a thousand years in some, some cases. So running them over much longer time periods, they're also much more involved. Uh, climate models are also run because they are so compute intense, they tend to be run on some of the most impressive supercomputers uh, globally. So they're, they're, they're pretty, pretty significant beasts. I do not run them myself. Um, I'm just a user of some of the outputs. I will also say that uh, as, science has in, as science has evolved, that these models have evolved as well. Um, you can see these three figures here on the left, in the middle, on the right. On the left, I, you know, I'm not even sure if I, if, I if, if I just showed you that figure and didn't tell you what you were looking at, you probably would know, have no idea what it was. It's like, are we playing Tetris or something? Um, obviously, as we move through time, we've been able to um, resolve some of the factors a bit better. A lot of that is through computational ability, right? Because we're having to solve so much from a temporal perspective and a spa the, the spatial perspective gets compromised a bit. So today, some of the climate models that we're running globally are running at around a 25 kilometer resolution, which means they're unable to capture all of the nuances, right? They're unable to capture some of the topography that we know is pretty important in defining even between Spokane and Spokane Valley, okay? Um, as we move forward in time, we might expect that some of these processes are simulated a bit better. Also through um, advances in um, other fields, uh, the interaction between the carbon cycle and the atmosphere, that information has been improved in climate models. So today we have about about 50 modeling groups globally running these models. And as a result, we have upwards of 100 models. And 100 models is a lot, right? So it's an interesting question, right? What do we do with all of these models? There's 100 of them, which one is right? And the answer is really none of them, or none of them are right, right? <laughs> They're all providing information. And um, you might think of it a little bit like, like the information you, you, you might see when you're looking at uh, land falling, a uh, hurricane that uh, might be approaching the eastern coast, and this is uh, Hurricane Ian, uh, a few days before it made landfall in southwestern Florida, right? We see a whole bunch of possible scenarios in which this in trajectories that this hurricane may take, strength as well in terms of these hurricanes, and this sort of uncertainty, right, might be problematic to some, but it also might be pretty important in defining the potential hazards that, that come about. Okay, so we can think about these different climate models as, as almost like almost like the different like lab rats, right? We, we're gonna we're gonna give them the same experiment, the same dose, right? Um, and we're gonna see how they perform. Um, and we want to look at sort of the constellation of outcomes. Any individual outcome might be viewed with a skeptical lens. Okay. So we'll talk a little bit about how these models uh, sort of work. We'll look at whether or not they pass the SNF test. Specifically here, we'll look at the Northwestern United States. We'll then take a look at how these models can be used to test hypotheses of the drivers of, of, of modern climate change, and then look a little bit about how these models project the future. So um, this is some really old work. I probably made these figures <laughs> not quite a decade ago, but pretty close, um, looking at the last generation of climate models. I, I will say that as time, goes, time has gone on, we've updated the generations of models. So this is the coupled, uh, the fifth generation of models that was used in the, the last, uh, second to last IPCC report. Um, the bottom line is that I have uh, a figure here. I have four figures, right? On the top, I have precipitation. Um, expressed in millimeters per month. On the bottom, I have temperature expressed in degrees Celsius. 
um, one of the columns is observations and one of the columns is models. The, the reality is, is that the models generally capture the, the patterns that we see in precipitation and temperature across the globe. You know, you can clearly see they're picking up uh, sort of uh, you know, an increase in precipitation along the coast here uh, from effectively Northern California all the way up into Alaska. Um, observations look very, very similar. Um, when we look at how these models perform specifically for the Northwest, and I'll sort of spare you uh, too many figures showing you this, this is a really simple way of looking at it. Do the models simulate the seasonal cycle of temperature on the left and precipitation on the right? Um, black line is showing us one, or one, one version of observations. All the little like thin lines here, those are individual models. So it's a good thing the models are simulating that it's hotter in summer than winter. <laughs> That's good. Um, they're generally capturing the seasonal cycle in precipitation as well, namely that the dry months, the dry season is sort of that July through September period. And that you, know, you can see a few models are a little bit wetter and a few models are a little bit drier, but they generally capture the right tempo and then they capture the right sort of spatial patterns of, of climate, uh, at least some of the simple elements of climate that we know about. Okay. Um, we'll talk a little bit about these models as they're used for testing hypotheses. So you might, you might sort of think about um, running a climate model and you want to test out a certain hypothesis. So a, hypo a hypothesis you might test out is we're going to take this model and we're going to, um, you know, expose it to uh, some sort of a change in atmospheric greenhouse gas concentration through time. Right? We could do the same thing where you could take a model and you could ask how it performs in response to a volcanic eruption or changes in solar activity, right? A whole bunch of possible perturbations. And ultimately, we're going to look at some sort of a climate response, right? And in this case, we'll look at just the change in temperature globally, a really simple way of looking at things. So um, uh, the, a real simple way that these models have been used for, uh, I would say, not necessarily uh, factually stating that climate, human-caused climate change is responsible for the warming, but providing another line of evidence to support that is through this sort of paired experiment, right? So we have uh, experiment one, which is where we basically march a bunch of climate models forward through time. And we only, we only, we only sort of throw in known variability, uh, uh, known variability in terms of solar activity and known large volcanic eruptions. Okay, and when we do that, we find essentially the traces look like the green lines you see here, where there's you know maybe a really small amount of warming up to say 1950 or so, and then essentially not much since. You see some dips here, a uh, really significant dip here in 1992, following the 1992 or 1991 uh, Mount Pinatubo eruption. Um, Effectively, experiment one does not jive with observations. So the observations here for reference are shown in black. So the second experiment is now we're going to run those same batch of models, except instead of only including solar and volcanic influences, we're also going to include the known influences of human activity, namely those associated with uh, greenhouse gas emissions, carbon dioxide, and methane, as well as aerosols. And aerosols are bright reflective matter. It turns out that human-caused aerosols tend to have a cooling effect, but the warming effect through greenhouse gases massively swamps that out. And you can see the brown, right? The brown is that experiment. And it basically shows um, that the, it basically shows substantial warming post-1950 really or so. And that the observed data more or less sort of jive with what you expect from that experiment. So that, that's one line of evidence that has been used uh, in scientific studies, and it's in the IPC as, IPCC as well, that allows us to you know, make a statement to the effect that uh, human activity is very likely responsible for the bulk of the warming that we've seen globally over the past 50 years. Okay, and this has been run through many, many models. So you're sort of seeing the sort of collection of model responses there. All models are a little bit different in terms of their response. Okay, so we'll talk here a little bit about the future. Um, 
in terms of how these models can be used to foretell the future. Um, and uh, as Brian mentioned, we have uh, the, 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 the COP27 going on, um, of course, which is sort of thinking about some of the potential international policies that might modify the pace of climate change moving forward. Um, there is good news and bad news on that front, right? The good news, of course, uh, is that I don't think climate, I don't think that we have been emitting as much carbon dioxide, um, at least the, the rate of increase of carbon dioxide over the past, say, five, or five to 10 years is not nearly as acute as it was maybe about 15 years ago. So we bend the curve a little bit on that. The bad news is that we're not bending it far enough. Um, and this, there's a couple of figures that came out uh, just last week from the Global Carbon Project, which is a really nice um, sort of synthesis with these clean figures every year. They update sort of where sort of carbon is coming from and going um, globally. And this is showing us that at least the global fossil, fossil fuel carbon dioxide emissions uh, over the past about 40, well, 30, 30, 30 plus years or so. Um, of course, the COVID-19 pandemic, there was a dip in carbon emissions globally, but in 21 and 22, things are back to where they were or just even above where they were pre-pandemic. So um, the good news, of course, is that if you look back here in 2000, 2005 or so, um, that we have bent that curve just a bit. The bad news is that, you know, we haven't necessarily plateaued yet. We're maybe getting close. So a little, depending on how you want to look at this, good news or bad news. Um, now, going forward, of course, and the reason I'm showing you this here is that, you know, climate models are run under a variety of scenarios, right? And so we're going to look at a, just a couple different scenarios of, of sort of how climate models are run. And we'll look at some of the scenarios for the future, specifically for the inland Northwest. Um, these scenarios, of course, involve a lot of uh, decisions or choices or trajectories, right? How, how, is, how is the future gonna proceed in terms of energy and carbon use? How are global economies gonna change? How are we, how are we gonna share across countries? Uh, I think the 8 billion, we have 8 billion people on the planet now, apparently as of yesterday. And so is that gonna go to 9 billion? Um, and then of course, what's gonna happen with carbon sequestration? Um, and so I, I wanna just focus here, this figure looks somewhat similar to the last one, but it includes land use change as well. So that's, that's why it's a little bit different. But um, I want to highlight the basically two, two scenarios just for reference that we're going to look at, right? One is this, what we call RCP 8.5. That, that is a future that I think we're avoiding for the most part. That's a track that we were on probably up till the, you know, the early 2010s or so. And that was really a future where we rely a lot on, a lot on, uh, a lot on coal. Um, and I think we bent that curve just a bit now. So um, the other scenario that I'll be looking at here is the RCP 8.5. And just for reference, this RCP 8.5 uh, basically would get us up to global carbon dioxide concentrations of like 900 parts per million by 2100, something like that. Today we're at like 400, so that's a lot more carbon in the atmosphere. Um, this RCP 4.5 is, is sort of today more of a middle of the road trajectory, one that we are potentially more aligned to. You can see that today we're maybe a little bit above the, a little bit above RCP 8.5, or sorry, 4.5 in terms of emissions, but maybe we'll flatline a little bit earlier, right? They sort of have, at least in this case, it sort of peaks in 2040. So. I want to show you those two to sort of bookend a couple of the scenarios. Of course, um, the, the, the COP27 uh, has goals of, of sort of stabilizing uh, overall warming to about two degrees Celsius, um, and that would require uh, emission trajectory, right, or massive carbon sequestration, maybe a little bit more in line with the blue line here. So um, that's a lot to ask for. The other thing that I'll just mention here, right? These are sort of how, how emissions may translate into the amount of warming. And so the, on the X axis here, we see cumulative carbon dioxide emissions since 1850 on the Y axis. This is the amount of warming globally since uh, basically 1850 or so. And so you can kind of see it's a linear, more or less quasi-linear uh, relationship here. 
the, the key thing is that a figure like this provides us with a general budget of, of how much carbon we have left to emit if we really want to keep warming to no more than two degrees Celsius. And that number ends up being something like 1200 gigatons of carbon. Um, and you can do the math here, right? Current rate of carbon emissions is 40. So basically <laughs> 30 years at current levels, we would get there. Hopefully we sort of slow that down a bit, but um, that's, yeah, that's sort of where we are. So that being said, we're gonna look at some of the sort of model changes in, in climate uh, for, the, for the Northwest specifically. And again, RCP 4.5, sort of middle of the road scenario um, emissions sort of plateau 2040 or so. And 8.5 is the sort of gangbusters, uh, heavy reliance on coal. I think we've sort of avoided that to some degree, but nonetheless, it's instructive to look at it. This is for the inland north, sorry, this is for the broader northwest, so Oregon, Washington, Idaho, and northwest Montana, pretty much centered over, you know, Spokane is pretty much there in the mix, um, right? The amount of warming that we've seen so far, just for reference, about maybe three degrees Fahrenheit or so, plus or minus, um, this suggests warming of uh, upwards of six degrees in a multi-model mean sense six degrees Fahrenheit by the end of the century for that um, middle of the road scenario, which is transformative in many ways, but not nearly as bad as, for example, the 11 degrees uh, Fahrenheit that would occur under the sort of other scenario. So certainly a lot of warming, a lot of variability from model to model as well. Okay, so there's some error bars and brackets that one could put on it. And that's why, that's what these model, climate models provide for us. Okay, um, that obviously will translate into more days of heat. And so um, I, this is a figure that I had on hand showing us sort of the climatological or expected average number of days above 90 degrees Fahrenheit. I consider that a warm day. Um, and you can kind of see what that looks like over the late 20th century. I think Spokane, you're averaging maybe like you know 14 days or so. Uh, of temperatures above 90 degrees Fahrenheit. For reference, in 2021, you had 42 days at the airport above uh, 90 degrees Fahrenheit. Turns out that looks somewhat similar to an average year um, by the mid-century. And this was the RCP 8.5. There's not a huge difference by mid-century. That, that difference really materializes towards the latter half of the century. So not a surprise here, right, with more heat. Um, the story for precipitation is, is, is actually more interesting to some degree, right? Um, uh, in the Northwest, there has been, uh, you know, not a huge change in precipitation. There's some, there's some differences in terms of changes when you look at individual seasons. Uh, globally, though, a warmer planet is actually a wetter planet to some degree. Precipitation increases as you get to a wetter planet, specifically at higher latitudes. Um, and the climate models tend to project a slight increase in precipitation, in annual precipitation for the Northwest. Um, and that might amount to somewhere between five and 10% by 2100. The difference though, between this figure and the previous figure of temperature is that a five to 10% increase in precipitation is pretty quickly swamped out by the massive year to year variability that we know is part of the climate. So slight increase, turns out that the, this increase is primarily winter and uh, maybe parts of spring. And the models end up projecting a slight decrease in precipitation in the summertime, which um, you know, may or may not be a, a bad thing, or maybe it may be a bad, may, it may be a bad thing as, as of course dry summers or dry and warm summers are a recipe for a certain hazards uh, in the region. One thing, of course, that is clear is that the combination of warming, even with an increase in precipitation, will have transformative effects on, um, uh, on the region's hydrology. And uh, these are some of the sorts of, uh, of, of, this is some of the sort of information that Brian was, was referencing that is part of the climate toolbox. Um, this is showing us here historically in February, the fraction of precipitation that falls is snow. Um, obviously a good mix in, in much of the inland Northwest in Spokane, maybe about half of it is half of it is snow, half of it is rain with warming, of course. Uh, a lot of that snow that does fall today falls at pretty warm temperatures. So you can imagine what happens as you move to a warmer climate, you do see a lot more of that precipitation falling as rain, 
less of it falling as snow. Um, and the fall, the rain, the sorry, the, the precipitation that does fall in the winter then runs off. And what that means is that you end up really shifting the water availability, the timing of water availability across a lot of natural systems in, in the Northwest and in certainly much of the Western United States. And, and this figure here is showing us uh, a hydrograph. So this is you know, stream flow, right? What, what's, what monthly stream flow would look like. And this is this here in central Washington, the, the river systems would look fairly similar. It depends a little bit about the topography of uh, topography and temperature of your, of your headwater regions. But the, you know, a system like this which is, is very much a snow melt dominated system where you see most of the runoff historically shown in black, most of it's happening here, May, June, July, right? That's really nice in a climate where much of the precipitation falls in the winter and spring and summers are dry. So this is a nice way to sort of provide continuity. Of course, with warming, right, you see an increase in runoff in the wintertime because that precipitation, more of that's falling as rain, less as snow. And then you see this pretty substantial decline here in runoff in the summer months, right? Part of what we already talked about in terms of some of the observed changes to date. And then sort of going full circle, um, we have looked as well at some of the projected changes in uh, fire activity across the US and this is looking here, this is one metric here looking at the occurrence of very large fires from a purely meteorological and climate perspective, right? We know that fires of course require fuel and ignitions, but they often occur in a recipe perspective, right? A lot of the fires that do large fires, 20,000 acres or more, or more will tend to occur when there is uh, antecedent or very dry fuels along with hot conditions, strong winds. And under climate change, those conditions that have historically led to very large fires are likely to come together more frequently. Um, some of this has already happened, frankly. So this study we did a few years ago, I, I think some of the projected changes are actually have been swamped by recent years. So um, some you may already have seen a preview of climate change, at least glimpses of it with some of the recent events that we've seen. So I want to provide some quick summary points before we open it up for uh, questions. We know that the Northwest and really much of the globe is not immune to climate variability, drought, and climate change. Um, the models that we talked about, they're imperfect, right? And science will continue to improve those models. Um, yet we can't wait for the models to be perfect before actually using those models to guide decision-making. Right, whether that's adaptation, right, or whether that's mitigation. The models have been insightful already. Um, they will get better, although I will say that some of the models that were put together, um, I think in the, in the 1970s or so under a doubled CO2 environment, provide to a reasonable degree some of the, some of the simi some similar results to what we're seeing today with models run on supercomputers. We're just adding details. We know the future looks, the future does look a lot warmer than we've his, seen historically, but we have seen perhaps glimpses of, of, of certain sorts of extremes that we expect to see more often, right? Um, for example, the 2015 snow drought, and of course the 2021 heat wave, those sorts of events will become more often. They may not happen every year. They still likely would be extreme events. Other sorts of extreme events may become less frequent. It just depends on context and location. So with that, I think I have a good place to, um, to end and uh, turn it over and maybe we can have uh, some Q&A. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Dr. Bazzaglou. You know, one of the dissatisfying things about being on a webinar is that you don't get this roar of applause. And uh, so everyone's right now thanking you for uh, sharing uh, about these complexities. And I, that was super clear. I can imagine um, being able to use this in, in a very variety of cir circumstances. So thank you for that. Reminder, everybody, that the Q&A feature is available. So go ahead and take a second, if you haven't already, and start putting a question in there. And while you're uh, doing that, you can also choose to vote questions up. So if you'd like uh, to increase the likelihood that I might ask it, uh, you can click the little th th up thumb arrow there. I'd like to pose the first question because I'm the moderator and I can do that. So <laughs> uh, 
So I'm curious about uh, whether or not you feel like climate models are, or I not feel, whether or not climate models are necessarily linear or, or reflect the reality as being uh, linear or whether they can capture non-linear or threshold events. So we know looking at uh, the evidence of, of past climate changes that some changes are rather rapid. Uh, I'm not talking about asteroids. I'm talking about other sort of, of, of unpleasant surprises. I think they're sometimes referred to non-linear threshold events. And, and so do you feel like, um, A, can climate models help us to expect those? And if they can't, then are we are, are we over relying on them and therefore not seeing possible mm -hmm. uh, thresholds that we're missing and is expecting things to be smoother or more linear as the scenarios project? Good question. Yeah. So these sort of um, these sort of events that might have sort of step change functions in climate, um, I, I think that there are some ways in which they they could capture processes like that. I will say that this is probably still one one of the outstanding questions in climate change. Um, these you know sudden rapid changes in climate, um, and by rapid we're talking about maybe a decade or so, right? Not like not like that, not like day after tomorrow, but within a decade. And so there are some there are some ways I think in which these climate models could capture processes like that. I'm thinking a little bit about, and this comes this would come about probably through the carbon cycle to some degree. So there there I think there are. We're, we're, I think models, the models are continually trying to improve the ability to capture carbon cycle phenomena. Um, there are some, there are a lot, there's a lot of methane in the shallow oceans in the Arctic. So one thing I know people are thinking about is, is whether or not with, with warming, uh, decay of, uh, of sea ice and sort of that releases, that, that may release some of the methane clathrates or hydrates, I can't remember exactly. And those could essentially volatize and, and actually enter into the atmosphere and increase atmospheric methane concentrations. Um, the models, one of the things I often like to do in my classes as well is talk about feedback processes. So I would say that in many, these models are absolutely nonlinear in that a process like that, releasing a bunch of methane into the atmosphere, right? would then have uh, downstream uh, consequences and other factors in the climate system. So you can imagine, if you, hypothetically, right, I'm not gonna follow the whole chain here, right? You release a bunch of methane into the atmosphere, atmospheric temperatures increase dramatically, you see massive, say, uh, plant die off in the Amazon, that carbon is then fluxed into the atmosphere. Um, you know, that would be a pretty substantial feedback process to change climate over a relatively short period. The other one is certainly, um, you know, massive uh, abrupt changes in, in, in sea ice or glaciers. Um, all these things I think are, are fairly unknown. And maybe we do somehow rely a lot. If we're relying too much on the statistics of climate models, um, we, we may cap, we may not fully capture some of these processes. And that's why there's that's that that's that, that, that's the scientists filling in some of those puzzle pieces as we go on. Fair enough. So let's turn to our audience. The audience is interested in hearing from Kate's question. She asks, or they ask, do people, uh, specifically big companies and politicians? view these models as trustworthy? Do they shape their actions based on what the models say? Or do they believe the charts are fabricated false information? Mm -hmm. I, I would say that companies are using these models um, because they know that it affects their bottom line. They're trying to get ahead of the curve on some of these decision-making processes. I, I mean, I just, I'll speak a little bit from my experience. I know I've, I've been contacted by, I think it was PepsiCo in Canada, and they're, they're already interested in using climate change information in terms of where crops may be grown in the future. Um, uh, yes, there are also going to be politicians who will want to dismiss science in general, and it's not just climate change, it's science, as we know, it's not just, it's not just climate change, it's science in general. Um, and we can all find, uh, we can all find charts to sort of prove our point. Um, but we also know that, for example, the, the US uh, military is using climate change information because it, they know that they, it, they know that the climate change affects their business and their ability to navigate um, the planet 
So I think it is really a mixed bag, but I think companies are taking it more and more seriously because they, they are already seeing that climate change is affecting their bottom line. I've found something similar um, and anecdotally, just people, business leaders usually like to know what might be coming and mitigate risk. And, and uh, so they, they tend to want more information and these give them more information. So, mm -hmm. um, so this question is from a student at Gonzaga, who's also an employee of the Climate Center. Ben Brown asks, as advocates, activists, and stakeholders, it's in our best interest to share the results of these models, especially when they return information that demands, oops, uh, that demands action be taken, but these models and data are esoteric and challenging for many audiences to understand. What are some of the most creative, accessible, and effective ways that you've seen complex climate models communicated with an audience of non-experts? Mm. That's a good question. Um, yeah, I do think that, and I'm not even sure that I did a great job sort of explaining models to, 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 to you all today. Um, but I do think that talking about models in any context probably tunes out half of an audience. <laughs> so, um, I mean, and so in, in some ways, right, models require us to either just trust it or understand some science behind it. And I don't think for many people, they have time to understand the science or want to understand science behind models. Um, there are probably, though, creative ways of, uh, and I'm sure I've seen many creative ways of, of visualizing or presenting models as, or scenarios of, of the future. Um, in many cases, right, we can think of scenarios and even in a planning perspective, how, how would you respond to scenario A, B, or C? Um, some of these scenarios are guided by the science. Um, that sort of information may be a little bit more palatable to certain audiences that may be not receptive to models, just the word models in general. <laughs> There's an interesting tool, I think it's called the Global um, Climate Simulation, or something to that effect where, like Model UN, uh, where you're it's a simulation. So you're given a country to represent and you negotiate your targets and reductions. But what's novel about it is that it, that it has uh, a climate model that you feed in the different targets that different countries negotiate as part of the simulation. And then it suggests this is what the future would look like if this wins or that wins or that wins. So it uses climate models to then sort of give life to uh, these simulations that someone can actually, you can actually run the simulation as part of a class or um, just an activity that you would do with your community group. And so I think it's a clever way of using the tools that you've developed, you know, to then allow people to sort of imagine futures, right? And, ima and imagine possible um, impacts if we do this, if we do that. So uh, I thought that was one of my favorite novel sort of ways of of taking a model UN-ish idea, but then using models to help um, give it life. Mm -hmm. uh, let's see, Kara Odegaard, who's a community member here in Spokane and worked on the Spokane Climate mm -hmm. Project, says, as I understand it, the climate toolbox goes beyond global climate models and includes more downscale data or localized data that is not captured in the global models. Can you speak more about this and how your climate toolbox might lead to more accurate projections for the Northwest than global models? So this has to do with the resolution issue, I think, that right, you were right, right. talking about earlier. Yeah, yeah, and Kara, thanks for the question, and thanks for your all, your 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 sort of you, you, as part of the Spokane Climate or what we what did we call it, Brian? Spokane, <laughs> Spokane Climate Project. Yeah, Spokane. I almost had it. Spokane Climate Project um, certainly helped sort of develop pizza parts of the climate toolbox. So yes, I didn't probably express climate models in general are fairly coarse in terms of their native resolution, right? So they're their sort of spatial scale natively might be on the order of 100 miles by 100 miles for a grid box. And so that that might sort of, if you think about sort of placing a grid box on the sort of uh, Washington, Idaho border, right, between Coeur d'Alene and Spokane, you're not getting the mountains or the valley that well. You're kind of getting a mishmash of, of stuff. So there are efforts, and my group has certainly worked on this, where we take global climate model output and we provide improved spatial detail through something called downscaling. And so the climate toolbox, 
gives us climate model output, but it's downscaled to a resolution that might be more actionable. So you can take information, you can take data for, for Spokane and it'll more, it'll, it'll better match the climate statistics that have occurred in Spokane. And then the projections will be more useful in terms of planning than raw, raw model output. I think this is related to a version of a question that I had as well. So I'm going to preface it by saying uh, sometimes scientists use words in a way that's different than the general public and that that can create misunderstandings and confusion. So a classic example of this is the idea of the word theory. Um, scientists use it in a very particular way. I might say I have a theory about Gonzaga winning the NCAA basketball tournament, but you using theory and me using theory, not the same thing. I'm wondering if there's an instance of that in the area of climate modeling uh, with the idea of bias correction. Mm -hmm. So um, I imagine a non-scientist hearing the phrase bias correction would be something like you have biases and so you're correcting for your biases because your models are inherently biased and so you're trying to overcome your inherent biases and so you're admitting uh, that and and I've kind of caught you. <laughs> yeah, yeah, um, yeah. Explain to me why I'm wrong. <laughs> You're right, but um, yeah. So that that is a really interesting point. That the, the use of the term bias correction suggests there's some error, right, or bias in the model. Um, and, in, and, and instead, what we are trying to do is better match climate model output to some version of obs observed climate data so that that information can be more directly used. Um, but uh, very good point that there are words like that that can certainly allow people to attack uh, science for a reason. <laughs> Bias corrections one, definitely. <laughs> Do you, maybe a related one is, um, am I right that you run, um, one of the ways you test models is by running them, this is not quite accurate, but by running them backwards, in other words, to see whether or not they could accurately predict the past? Right, um, right. Could right. you briefly, uh, I've always found that's an interesting, that's a really smart way if you wanted to build a model and see, you can't test it on whether or not you're right about the future because it hasn't happened yet, but you could build a model and say, does it predict what we know happened in the past? Like, does it say, this is what happened and this is what should happen given our model. Could you briefly speak that's to right. that way of testing models, the climate yeah. models in particular? That's right. So I think the example that I provided with the two experiments where we looked at the observed, we looked at the observed climate in terms of global temperature over the past 170 years or so is probably one of the examples that I, I use most frequently where we, we know the past. But we also know in terms of how solar activity, volcanic activity, and then uh, CO2, methane, and aerosol concentrations have changed over the past. And that provides us with a way of, of using the models, running different experiments, and evaluating how well they're able to capture some of the past phenomena. Um, same things have been used with volcanic eruptions, right? So do these models accurately capture how volcanic eruptions influence climate? We have, we have some observations from like Pinatubo, then we can run the climate models with volcanic eruptions and see how they, how they capture those processes yeah. and phenomena. One more on this wonky direction before we go back to less wonky ones. David Camp, uh, a, another colleague here in Spokane works on climate issues, asks, does the ensemble modeling method tend to interfere with accounting for feedbacks since only a minority of models include them, so they are outvoted by the combination of several models in the ensemble? Um, I remember in the climate toolbox, in the whisker box, pl box plot tool, for example, you've got a range of models. Um, yeah, and so it just kind of presents them all as equal in a, in a way. Um, I, I think this is part of the point. Do you have a, a comment on on the risks of, of that approach? Yeah, so I think that's that's fair, right? So um, if you look at like an ensemble average, right, you're taking some conservative view, you're, you're limiting the potential for models that have, for example, high sensitivity to human caused climate change, and also models that have low sensitivity to human caused climate change. Um, and so while that may provide you with a single answer, um, you may be missing some of the, some of the, you may be missing truth, right? So some of the models that may be simulating a high sensitivity to climate change, right? Those models may be capturing 
strong positive feedback processes that are bad, even though positive feedback sounds good. <laughs> um, and, and that's why maybe using, when, if you're using an ensemble of models, think about the statistics and use that as a planning perspective. Um, certainly that ensemble mean will sort of cancel things out to some degree. It'll give you a useful, it'll give you a useful answer, but one answer is probably not what we're looking for in general. Uh, let's see. So going back to a general group here, let's look for the question from Alexis. Alexis asks, how can the average person understand which climate models are credible and which shouldn't be given as much weight? Hmm. That's a good question. Um, I would be surprised if an average person is looking at individual climate models, first of all. However, this question comes up a lot in sort of in scientific studies where we want to look at many, many climate models, but oftentimes we may only want to look at say three because computationally we're limited, et cetera. And so in that case, we may want to look at models that, for example, aren't able to capture, for example, looking back at my example for Northwestern precipitation, there might be a model in there that says, hey, it's this climate has a wet summer and dry winter. Well, that's probably not a good model to use going forward for a climate change perspective. So these sort of evaluation metrics may be useful for sort of weeding models out, identifying models that are turkeys. Um, there are some models that, at least that we've looked at, that don't always pass the sniff test and those ones may not be as credible. One of the things I like about the climate toolbox, uh, which again, I, I post in the chat, but it's just at www.climatetoolbox.org and, and it's free free and available, is that you you don't just based on, you don't just pick a model and say, these are projections using that model. I really like that it's trying to take what we know from a whole bunch of models and shows those, but it's, you know, I, I like that it, it gives me more confidence. Yeah, I'm not sure if I, I should, but that's, I like being able to see the range of, of what those different models are suggesting. And I can draw my own inferences rather than just mm -hmm. sort of tossing all your eggs into, into one model's basket. Mm -hmm. So I see that as a, as a strength. Um, let's see, let's take a few more of these short ones. Uh, Damon asks, do the existing models account for radiation and heat associated with sun's solar flares and explosions? You briefly talked about uh, on your chart about with, you know, sun yeah. plus yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, volcanoes. And I mm -hmm. think this might be asking about more, maybe more exceptional um, solar yeah. events. Right, right. So certainly, right, we know that there is solar variability. Um, and that is, is, is captured as an input into the model. So the models are sort of simulating uh, A, the seasons, right? And, and then B, sort of variations in terms of um, incident solar radiation at the top of the atmosphere that might be influenced by uh, solar activity. So uh, that, that is captured. Um, and it, it's a little bit, it was a little bit hard to see in the, in the sort of the figures I showed, but there, there, there is just a really small influence of, 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 of solar activity in the climate change that we've experienced so far. We've warmed by whatever, 1.2 degrees Celsius, maybe solar activity contributes 0 0.05 or something degrees Celsius worth of it. Thanks, let's see. Pick up maybe one or two more. So uh, the question from Gabe uh, DiMartino, how well do these models align with uh, several political organizations and companies aiming to become net zero by 2036? Do they have a proper chance of meeting these goals? I guess, according to the, so I guess if the, is the maybe I'm not sure if this is the question, it, given the models, can they achieve their net neutrality goals by those dates? I guess maybe that's one way of putting the question, I think. Yeah, so I, I think probably, no, I don't know how much these models are used in that context, which is more of a sort of climate mitigation perspective. Um, but the models provide, uh, again, motivation for net zero by a certain year um, with that goal of limiting the amount of warming globally to like two degrees Celsius worth of warming. I should add that, I mean, so climate models provide one line of evidence to suggest the sensitivity of 
the planet to increases in carbon dioxide concentrations. Um, and they're the one that we, can have, we have the most access to. We can form, perform experiments on, et cetera. Uh, other lines of evidence, right? The paleoclimate record, right? That dates back, you know, million, billions of years. We have carbon dioxide. We have estimates of proxy estimates of temperature. We can get other estimates of the sensitivity of the climate system to CO2. We do a little bit with the observational record. Um, they all sort of line up, you know, giving a similar, similar sort of estimates such that I think for a doubling of CO2, the planet warms by two, two and a half to four degrees Celsius. I think that's sort of where we are. Um, I have a question that was once put, I think, by um, James Lovelock. The, uh, so I, if I recall correctly, who's died relatively recently, right, and, and famously controversial um, proponent of, of the Gaia hypothesis. And part of his concern about modeling or over what he, I think he would say over-reliance on modeling is that it, um, I think one of the ways he put it was that it is assuming that we can just take the physics and the chemistry um, and 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 uh, expect that we would understand what would happen to the planet next, rather than also the biology and the ecology. And I'm curious uh, whether or not the models have gotten sophisticated enough. Would you say to to fully include what we know about biology and ecology in their projections, or whether or not they're mainly the physics and the chemistry? Um, and and so, how would you respond to his mm -hmm. concern, it, it, or maybe? I'm not sure. I think I'm accurately reflecting his concern. But anyway, do you think he's wrong in, in saying that they're mainly based on the physics um, or not on that part? I think that's where a lot of the scientific advances in modeling, besides the massive increase in compute um, ability, has, has sort of moved into sort of. And a lot of it, a lot of it deals with the carbon cycle, right, which involves a lot of living you know, a lot of the living planet. Right. And so that I think that's where there's been a lot of focus probably over the past 10 years or so. I think the, the basic physics, you know, we sort of had that a while ago. Um, but I will say, right, as somebody who works a bit on fire, um, mo the models are still not capturing sort of the dynamics of fire, which of course is a process through which as, as, as fire burn, carbon is released into the atmosphere and then vegetation regrows and assimilates carbon. That, that process isn't, isn't perfect yet. So there's still room for improvement on sort of the, the biota. Um, I think that is an area where there has been growth and there will continue to be growth though. So to put it in, in instead of a positive way, you, if I put it in a negative way, that's where it still has shortcomings? There's still shortcomings there. Yeah. Uh -huh. Okay. Uh, wanted to return to the slides about precipitation, just ask a clarifying question, that because this has come up recently in, mm -hmm. in the Spokane area. Um, so the projections are unclear for our area about precipitation, mm -hmm. or, or they're not, not unambiguous. Um, but it looks like a little bit more in the winter probably more as rain. Mm -hmm. um, maybe you said also a little bit more in the spring, but, um, and, and probably less in the summer. So that's, I think, uh, what we've understood in terms of the models and what we've been, we've been saying. But I wanted to ask two clarifying questions. One is whether or not there's reason to expect that there'll be fewer larger precipitation events, um, that uh, the um, overall average might be slightly higher, but we might get it in fewer events. That seems to sometimes mm -hmm. be happening in some places and whether sh we should expect mm -hmm. that too. And then two, whether or not that precipitation picture has any significant um, story to tell about hydroelectricity generation in our, mm. in our area. Right, 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 right. Yes. So in general, um, I don't have the specifics, but in general, we do expect that the wet extremes increase, have a larger increase than your average precipitation, right? And so uh, I think your statement on um, more of your precipitation falling in fewer events is probably true. I do think that there's a, I do think there's also a, a, an increase in the number of dry days in an annual sense. So that puts more onus on fewer events to control annual precipitation. And, and part of what happens when you do that, when you have fewer wet days and more of your precipitation falling in fewer days, and this is the story of California, variability, you know, more year-to-year -year variability. Um, and that creates some havoc for, 
<laughs> for everyone from a water manager to a fish. Um, right. I, I don't think I, I, I so that the aspect, usually when we talk about climate change, we talk about changes in means, right? Or even changes in extremes. Changes in variability can be pretty important from a yeah. lot of management perspective. And that's part that hasn't been examined as in detail. Um, there is a, I think there is a, some increase in variability um, just due to the processes we talked about. Yeah, the agriculture being, you know, in our region. Uh, yeah. Right. If you're a farmer and you're on the plus and you're relying on it raining, that's, you you know, that's a, variability is a, is is already part of your life, but that that's scary when you've got a huge event and then no, nothing for months. Um, right. And so that's, that's not good for farming, not good for forests. Um, okay, let's see, maybe one more Parado. Um, I think if the general consensus of climate models is based on an average of the combined outputs, would you say that it would be beneficial to run as many as possible in order to get one of the most basic outcome? And we kind of talked about this a little bit, but I think is your answer, that's your approach? Yeah, yeah. I mean, in a perfect world, we would have as many statistics to pull from. It's a little bit like if you're running a test so with COVID, with you know with the COVID nineteen vaccine, um, if we could only test it out on ten people, um, we might not be able to understand all of the potential outcomes. Um, if we could test it out on a million people, that <laughs> might be hard to do, right? There's some challenges in doing that, um, but we might have a, a a more full picture of of some of the you know some of the responses so the same sort of thing comes from a climate model perspective there are modeling groups now that are running their model multiple times um, and this gets a little bit into the weeds so most of the climate models that i talked about here today right i'm showing you one realization of the future but it turns out there's many possible realizations in the future even with a single experiment and that's just because of some internal variability so there are modeling groups now that are running what we call large ensemble projects where they're a single model is being run a hundred times. And from that, we can get a better depiction of some of the changes, especially things like variability, things like extremes, things that we care about, things that are gonna impact a lot of the systems we care about. Maybe for our last question, I'll go to Barbara. Um, she, and I'm gonna, Pose it the way she does, and then kind of may, maybe add to it. What geographical regions on the planet are most poorly understood climate-wise, and thus poorly modeled? Another way of taking a version of what I think this question is asking is: Is there a, a climate justice aspect to uh, a modeling gap? Uh, if there's uh, less um, or uh, complete data available for certain parts of the world, does that mean that our models are themselves not accurately reflecting what's likely to happen there, and therefore, and we're less concerned because we're not there or we just aren't funding the science. They don't have the scientists, et cetera. Is that true? Right. Uh, maybe to some degree, I, I, that may be, maybe to some degree true. It is absolutely true that even if the climate models are, 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 are simulating climate in these areas that might be poorly studied fine, the ability to translate the models down to impacts is extremely limited. Um, I was in Mexico last week. Um, the UC is trying to work with universities in Mexico to improve their ability to work on agriculture and water challenges and climate change is one of them. Um, and they have, they have significant challenges in getting just climate observations in their region because of conflict, right? Uh, monetary issues, and that leaves them very unprepared to deal with climate change. And um, there are areas in the world that are worse off than Mexico in that context. So the, there is an issue whereby a lot of resources are being poured into developing climate adaptation programs and climate data sets in affluent countries. And it is unfortunately leaving some of the countries that are bearing the brunt of the impact unprepared um, from even just from a data perspective, they are somewhat unprepared. Yeah. Well, you have been so generous uh, to take all of our questions and provide a really, I think, a wonderfully clear explanation of models. So thank you very much for that. And the Spokane community really thanks you for the tools that you've built and the way that it's helped us to better understand projected impacts on our particular community. Again, for those of you who are in our area, if you haven't already, go to www.spokaneclimateproject.com 
org to read about um, our particular uh, climate impact assessment here. Uh, go to climatetoolbox.org to play with the tools uh, that we've been mentioning. And let's all thank uh, Dr. Batsaglu for an excellent talk. Again, um, just share uh, one last uh, bit here while we, we uh, uh, share that uh, these events you know, could benefit from your support if you're able to provide it. So uh, if you have the means, consider uh, sharing some of those with the Climate Center so we can continue to host events like this so we can help our community uh, both here in the inland northwest and across the country better understand and respond to the challenge of a changing climate. Uh, we will be soon uh, releasing our spring lecture series, which will have another slate of great events uh, freely available to the community. Uh, thank you all for coming tonight, and we'll be uh, posting this on our YouTube channel soon. Thanks again, Dr. Batsaglu. It was a pleasure to have you. Thank you, Brian. Thanks, everybody.